Hi, folks. Welcome to Quarantine Coffee Hour um, with, the, with the Erie Canal Museum. I'm your host, Derek Pratt, the educator at the museum, and I'm joined today by a special guest, Dave Ruck from Buffalo, New York. Howdy. Hi, Derek. How, how's it going today, Dave? It's going well, you know, all things considered. <laughs> it's a nice uh, summer day here. It's not snowing, so uh, things are looking always, up. Always a plus in Buffalo. Our, That's right. Our curator is jealous that you guys won the uh, the Golden Snowball this year. Did we? I didn't hear that. I know I Syracuse so. usually wins it. Yeah, it was either you or Rochester. We were okay. a few inches behind. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, we'll get started here in a little bit. Um, okay, we've got people watching. Uh, well, a few. We'll give we'll give people some time to start watching, um, and I'll do what I usually do to to waste some time here. I don't know if anyone actually enjoys this or not, but I always talk about how I'm drinking my recess coffee, uh, locally made here in Central New York. Remember to to drink local, folks. And uh, the mug today is I got it at the World War II Memorial in Washington D.C. Great, great memorial, and uh, it was Memorial Day this week, so. Good, good time to bust it up. Um, uh, please say hi in the comments. You guys know the drill at this point. Um, and we'll get started here shortly. And this is going to be a pretty unique quarantine coffee hour. Dave's going to be playing music for us. So if no one else enjoys it, at least I will. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, Carol Pratt says hi. Hi, Carol. What? Hi, Mom. Ah. Oh, and Lynn says hello, and Vicky. All right. Hi to all you guys. Um, well, uh, we, we might as well just get, get started here. Uh, let me know if you guys can see Dave. I'm having trouble on my end. But I've been talking, so that might just be why. Okay, well, I can start talking and see if people can hear me. You can let me know if all systems are go there, Derek. Uh, sound like it. Um, but real quick, hello to Joe from Kentucky and Carol from Manhattan, Kansas. The Wildcats, I guess. And all Vanessa right. in New Mexico. We've got people from all over the country here. All right, awesome. Awesome indeed. Should we get underway? Yes, I think so. Great. Um, so I don't know if anybody uh, saw the article that the museum put out earlier this week, but um, it was referencing the the canal song that we all know and, and love. I guess most of us love it. Uh, the one many of us learned in grade school about the mule named Sal um, and kind of the origins of the song. And it's, it's, it's not exactly um, as we, as it was presented to us in elementary school, it's not necessarily a song that was sung a lot on the, uh, on the horse and mule canal. Uh, so I'd written a long article about as much as uh, we sort of know currently about uh, the origins of that song. So I thought we would get to that eventually uh, today, but first I'll start with a couple other low bridge songs. Um, there are many, and so uh, maybe Derek can fill us in. I've heard some stories about uh, this whole notion of the bridges having been built too low on the original canal. Um, mm. I've seen a lot of different uh, reference points on why that was, but I think the one that comes up the most often is they were trying to save money. Is that your understanding, Derek, as to why the bridges got built too low on the original canal? I, I think I have heard that one uh, before. Yeah, and that that seems fairly makes sense uh, that they didn't. I've also heard later on that they started building the railroads for intentionally building the canal bridges as low as they possibly could. To... Right. Yeah, and that that's that's a common story you see out there. But of course, the railroads. Uh, didn't come along till the early 1830s. So uh, on the original canal, if the bridges were too low, there must have been another reason. And uh, perhaps they were trying to save money. Of course, New York State paid for the whole thing ourselves. So uh, 
you know, cutting corners might have been uh, a high priority. Right. So uh, we, as a result, we have lots of uh, canal folklore and also lots of canal music referencing the low bridges on the canal. So uh, I'll start with a couple of those. I want to start with a song um, of the Bullhead Boat. I'm sharing my screen here. I hope, hope folks can see that. Um, I'm going to try to make this a little bigger if I can. This image. Let's see. All right, good. Hopefully that was made a little bigger. This is a uh, an image of a bullhead boat. So a bullhead boat on the canal, they were built up and down the canal from Buffalo to Albany. And uh, bullhead boats had a deck that went all the way up, as you can see, to the top of the cabin. So it was an enclosed boat that was great for hauling perishable items and things that needed to be protected from the weather. Um, but you had a real problem uh, if you were standing on the deck of a bullhead boat, as you can see these people are. Look how high up off the canal they are. So as you're approaching each of those low bridges, those became uh, a particular issue uh, for you on a bullhead boat. So uh, start with a song from a canal boat captain's diary. This is uh, lyrics that he had written down 19th century um, around the Syracuse area. And we don't know if he composed these verses himself or if it's something he heard on the canal and just uh, jotted down so he could remember the words. It's just common practice back then. Uh, but it was set to music by a wonderful musician in, in the Albany area named George Ward. Uh, so this is called Boating on a Bullhead. Uh, a tale of upward mobility on the Erie Canal for a young man. I was sleeping in the line barn, eating beans and hay. Boss a kick in my stern every night and every day. So I hired out canaling as a horny hand of toil. Driving mules that kept a ball and on the towpath smelly soil. On the towpath smelly soil, my boys, the towpath smelly soil. Mules that kept a ball and on the towpath smelly soil. But my feet raised corns and blisters, the mules but raised a stink. Roped me feet and threw me twisters, plumb into the dirty drink. So I thought I'd give up driving, well the cap he thought so too. Says he hire out to diving or go bow in the canoe. Or go bow in the canoe, my boys go bow in the canoe. Says he hire out to diving or go bow in the canoe. I was drying on the heel path, watching boats all up and down, shivering from the first bath that I'd had since I'd left town. When a boat hauled in the basin at the wood dock for the night, I lost no time to hasten round that bridge to ask a bite. Round the bridge to ask for a bite, my boys, a bridge to ask a bite. I lost no time to hasten round that bridge to ask a bite. So they filled me up with beans and shoat, lighted me a cob. Asked me could I steer a boat, they offered me a job. Next morning I was boosted to the stern cabin's roof. With a tiller there I roosted and I watched the driver hoof. Sure, I watched the driver hoof, my boys, I watched the driver hoof. With a tiller there I roosted and I watched the driver hoof. Now that boat, she was a bullhead, decked up to her cabin top. There's many canalers now are dead that had no place to drop. When the bowsman, he'd forget to yell, low bridge, and duck her down. That bullhead steersman went to hell with a bridge string for a crown. With a bridge string for a crown, my boys, a bridge string for a crown. That bullhead steersman went down there with a bridge string for a crown. We was loaded down with star brand salt, the cap was loaded too. I wouldn't say it was his fault, but what is a man to do? When the bridge was only a heave away, we saw it round the bend. To the cap a word I didn't say while turning end over end. While turning end over end, my boys turning end over end. To the cap a word I didn't say while turning end over end. Never steer a bullhead boat. You'll 
wind up some fine morning in the ear, i.e. afloat. Do all your navigating in a line barn full of hay. Low bridge you won't be hating, and you'll live till Judgment Day. Sure, you'll live till Judgment Day, my boys, you'll live till Judgment Day. Low bridge you won't be hating, and you'll live till Judgment Day. <laughs> A cautionary tale. I gotta go. I feel bad. He was he was carrying Syracuse salt, I believe, there when he, he... was indeed Star Brand Salt. Uh, we got a few more people watching uh here. We've got the Elena and Dennis Reed. Uh, hello guys. Yep. Uh Al Williamson and uh Renee Ballesteros from the Museum of South Texas History. I didn't know him. Uh so hi everybody thanks for joining uh that's a that's a fun little song there yeah it sure is i love the language in these old songs derek um it's just sort of a, a window a window into the past uh, hello guys there i am talking again and uh renee Ballesteros from the museum oops it's okay all right sorry derek i missed the last thing you said i don't remember what I said either. So, oh, okay. but we were talking about the the language on the yeah songs. yeah um, just uh, wonderful, wonderfully colorful and evocative uh, for me at least. And um, it, you know sometimes that's where these canal songs come from. I um, I first got interested in canal songs around the mid '90s. Uh, I probably learned um, the the mule the 15 years or miles on the Erie Canal song in grade school, but then promptly forgot about it for the next 20 years or so. But um, I got hired uh, to play in a group that was going into schools in the Buffalo area to play uh, music from New York State's history. And uh, so typically fourth grade is the, is the year that uh, New York State students learn about uh, local history, state history. So uh, they had this presentation where they'd go in and sing Erie Canal songs and other music from the Adirondacks and the Catskills and kind of do a, a New York State sampler. So I came in as a musician who could sing a little bit and play a few instruments. Um, they were a trio, and I really didn't know anything about canal music or um, New York State history other than, you know, having lived here most of my life. Um, and so... I sort of fell in love immediately, both with the the idea of performing for kids and teaching history through music. I'd always been interested in history. And then also, um, kind of in, uh, no pun intended, but in digging deeper into, um, into this folklore, into this music that we had right here in our own home state, you know. Um, and so it started a long path that I'm still on today of trying to discover as much as I can about the musical culture surrounding the Erie Canal and the Great Lakes, uh, particularly in the 19th century. And so we have lots of different categories of songs. That last song is type of song that was, is found, they're just lyrics that are found in a canal boatman's diary. So uh, we know they were used on the canal, but you know, there's, there's some mysteries there in terms of were they sung, were they spoken, were they recited, uh, what was the tune they were sung to, or were there many different melodies they were sung to. There are other songs that were sort of professionally composed in the 19th century about the canal. And so I want to do one of those now, unless you have any uh, questions or anything that have come up. Oh, no, go, go ahead. Great. Um, actually, I'll play the banjo again. Uh, I'm a Pete Seeger fan, so I'm always... Ah, I always that. All right. Well, Pete Seeger got untold hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people into the banjo. Um, <laughs> So this is one you might have heard if you were in one of the entertainment houses in on the Buffalo waterfront or in Albany at a theater uh, or perhaps along the way. This is a song that was written for, um, for the vaudeville stage in the 1880s by a, a very well-known uh, theatrical uh, 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 a couple of composers who wrote for theater. Uh, Harrigan and Hart were their names, and um, they wrote a song about low bridges on the Erie Canal that people used to sort of get up and gallop to in these uh, in these dance halls and theaters, and uh, originally with sort of uh, dialect lyrics or at least uh, dialect pronunciation of some of the some of the lyrics, which I will not get into. Um, 
they sort of wrote it in, in, the, in the voice of a, a black man, uh, an African-American person. I'll just sing the lyrics for you uh, straight up. Uh, fairly entertaining song about, um, well, I think you'll hear the, the thread of humor in it. It's about all those dangers out there on the four feet or by then seven feet of water on the Erie Canal. Let's see. It's many miles to Buffalo. Oh, that low bridge. Bulky mule, she's moving slow. Oh, and there's a singing part in here for all of you who are relaxing with your phone or your computer and you feel like jumping in. Uh, we won't hear you, so sing as loud as you like and with embarrassing abandon. Um, Sing, uh, there, when we come to the chorus, I'll sing the words, Look out that low bridge, and you can sing that back to me. You can sing, Look out that low bridge. So let's try that. Look out that low bridge. 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 Excellent. The Captain Cook and all the crew, oh, duck your heads way down. And if you really feel like getting into it, you can... Bow your head a little bit there. The captain, cook, and all the crew, oh, duck your heads way down. Fastest ship in all the fleet, two sisters, comes to town. So you'll see where all of that comes in. It's many miles to Buffalo. Oh, that low bridge. Bulky mule, she's moving slow. Oh, that low bridge. There's gravel on the towpath. Hornets in the sand. Oh, pity, poor canaller. So far away from land, so look out that low bridge. Look out that low bridge. Look out that low bridge. The captain, cook, and all the crew, oh, duck your heads way down. Fastest ship in all the fleet, two sisters, comes to town. There's many locks to shut you in. Oh, that low bridge. Every worm must learn to swim. That low bridge, we're loaded down with barley and lumber from the west. Now every poor canaler, now do your level best. So look out that low bridge. Look out that low bridge. Look out that low bridge. The captain cook and all the crew, oh, got your heads way down. Fastest ship in all the fleet, two sisters comes to town. How the sun does shine Oh, that low bridge In rain or stormy weather The captain's on the poop All huddled all together We are like chickens in a coop So look out That low bridge Look out That low bridge The captain cook and all the crew Oh, duck your heads way down Fastest ship in all the fleet Two sisters comes to There's groceries in the cabin there. Oh, that low bridge never leaks, she's full of tar. Oh, that low bridge, there's freckles on the children, blanders on the mules, mosquitoes by the million that keep that golden rule. So look out that low bridge. Sorry, I didn't sing along every time, Dave. I, oh, that's okay. I, I wanted us to retain some viewers. Uh, well, see, uh, singing along on Zoom gets problematic as well because there's a slight delay. So uh, I've learned that the hard way from I do a lot of these sort of virtual presentations for school groups and such. And uh, if you try to be there's a there's a what's called latency or lag where there's a about a anywhere from about a quarter second to a three 
three quarter second delay between when I say something or sing it and when you hear it and then sing back. So it gets real messy if you're trying to sing back and forth in real time online. Interesting. But, look at that, look uh, at that folks. You're getting a. So, so you have a you have a past, Derek, the, um, that you don't need to jump in and sing if you don't want. Uh, but for everyone else out there, again, we can't hear you. So uh, so belt it out if you if you so choose. Yeah, yeah please. I, we encourage that, folks. Uh, a uh, an interactive quarantine coffee hour. Speaking of that, uh, after the Pete Seeger little discussion there, we asked uh, who everyone's favorite uh, folk musicians are. Uh -huh. So far, we've got two answers. Uh, Dennis Reed Jr. said Dave Rock. <laughs> and uh, we got uh, Joe LeMay said the, the Dady Brothers. Oh, yeah. Do you know that you must know the Dady Brothers, Derek? I, I'm not familiar with them, actually. Ah, well, they um, around uh, when was it? I guess around the 175th anniversary of the canal. So that of the canal's opening. So that would have been right around the year 2000. Um, they were commissioned to put together a CD. They're long, they were a long running Irish group, um, uh, two brothers, and they would flesh out the band with some other musicians sometimes uh, from the Rochester area. And they've been playing locally for decades. And um, so being sort of uh, the most well known Irish folk musicians in, in Western New York, they were commissioned to put together a CD of Erie Canal songs around the year two, it must have been around the year 2000. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful recording, and uh, they went to people like George Ward, who um, kind of is a pioneer in this in this regard, and um, put out a wonderful CD, which is probably available in the Erie Canal gift shop, museum gift shop, I would think, um, I, I if, think you, if you ever get to go back into the building. Um, uh, so, and uh, one of the two Dady brothers sadly passed away a year or so ago, um, but uh, I believe it's John... John Dady is still uh, still doing his thing. And uh, they're just, in addition to being real fun and great musicians, they're just wonderful guys, uh, both of them. I got to spend at least a little bit of time with each of them over the past uh, several years and uh, before Joe passed away. Uh, I hope I'm getting those two names right. If I'm not, somebody please correct me. Um, so uh, that's who the Dady brothers are. Shall we carry on, Derek? Any other questions that are coming um, yeah, up? Yeah, sure. Um, got Dan Ward uh, mentioning that the Lowbridge song was popularized in a blackface minstrel show, uh, but it was popular in the along the canal. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, you know, when we talk about people in that era around the canal singing canal music, that's mostly not what was happening. <laughs> they were not singing about the canal very often. They were singing the popular music of the day, which was for vast sections of the of the 19th century was the music of the minstrel shows. And there's a whole connection between the Erie Canal and the music of the minstrel shows and how the canal really transported that music across the state um, from Buffalo to ultimately New York City. Um, but that was kind of America's first real popular music. Um, and so that's the kind of thing you would hear if you were down at the Buffalo waterfront on Canal Street in the 1850s, 60s, um, along with Stephen Foster songs. And there's some crossover there with, with minstrel activity and Stephen Foster. Um, but that was the popular music of the day and not always or mostly not uh, referencing the canal. But occasionally these guys would write music about the canal. We also have lots of great reports of sailors coming in to Buffalo Harbor off the Great Lakes, ending up in some of the taverns in Buffalo and uh, either getting up on stage like the entertainers that have been hired to perform on stage would make room for the sailors who could sing. You know, many of the sailors were pretty good singers um, and they had huge voices on them. We have lots of lots of uh, different reports about, you know, boy, he had a good set of lungs on him, you know, because if you're singing on a on a, a, a sailing ship, uh, to do heavy work, um, you know, singing the work songs, uh, you needed to have bi a big voice. So these sailors would end up in the taverns and sometimes the professional entertainers would make room for them in between their sets and the, they'd call the sailors up and the sailors would get up and sing a couple songs um, on the stage in these in these Buffalo taverns. So man, to have been there just to hear that for, for one night, um, lost opportunity. So I'm gonna sing you a song. 
Yeah. I'm going to sing you a song. If you've ever heard that song about the E or I E was rising and the gym was getting low, um, this is kind of the precursor to that. And I was able to piece it together from a couple disparate sources. Uh, an old time fiddler, 20th century guy named Mark Hamilton, uh, who Dan Ward probably knows uh, or knew. Um, he was a, a wonderful uh, dance fiddler. He called, uh, he did all the dance calling for his own fiddling and he sang a bunch of songs that he had inherited. And uh, he said, here's one they sang when they built the Erie Canal and he sang this little fragment. And it, I could tell it was this, that sort of, uh, the Erie was rising from that sort of family of songs, but it, sa it just sounded more archaic than that. And then I came across some lyrics uh, from a Great Lakes sailor uh, that closely matched uh, what Mark Hamilton had been singing. So I sort of married the text from the sailor and the, the melody from Mark Hamilton. Uh, it's more information than probably most of you want. But uh, I'm going to sing it for you. This is another one of those, uh, again, a low bridge song of sorts, but also another one that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, plays up the dangers on the Erie Canal. So this is called, well, I call it the Erie O Canal. <laughs> Chorus is, haul in your bowling boys, stand by you sorrel mule. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arising and our gin is getting low and I don't think I'll, I'll, I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. So go ahead and try that, Derek. That was long. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Haul in your bow lines. Comes around several times. Jump in on any part that you want to. All right. All in your bowling, boy, stand by, you sorrel mule. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arising, and our gin is getting low. And I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. We just came down from Buffalo on the good ship called the Danger. A long, long trip on the eerie boys, and I feel just like a stranger. Terrible winds and heavy weather, forget it, I never shall. For I'm every inch a sailor boy on the Erio Canal. Fall in your bowling, boys, stand by, you sorrel mule, low bridge. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arising, and our gin is getting low. And I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. I can get that part. Well, two days out, we struck a fog. No land we could espy. Then a pirate ship bore down on us with his goddamn wicked eye. We hollered to the captain to hoist a flag of truce. But it was just the boat three sisters out four days from Syracuse. All in your bowling, boy, stand by, you sorrel mule. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arising, and our gin is getting low. And I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. Well, the next day out, we struck a fog, no land we could espy. Then a pirate ship bore down on us with his god... No, we already did that. The next day out, we struck a rock of Lackawanna coal. It gave our boat a great big shock and stove in quite a hole. We hollered to the driver on the towpath treading dirt. Well, he climbed aboard and he fixed that leak with his lousy undershirt. Haul in your bowling, boy, stand by, you sorrel mule. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arising, and our gin is getting low. And I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. Well, after two weeks' time, we reached the Hudson, there was Sal and me and Hank. We greased ourselves in tallow fat and slid ashore on a plank. Now Sal, she's in the pest house and the rest of the crew's in jail. And I'm the only surviving bum who's left to tell the tale. 
Haul in your ballin' boy, stand by you sorrel mule. Low bridge, duck your head, don't stand there like a fool. The eerie she's arisin' and our gin is getting low. And I don't think I've had a drink since we left old Buffalo. <laughs> All right. There you have it. Yeah. I sang that uh, more or less the way you might have heard it on on the canal in the 19th century. Most of these guys who were singing these songs were not up on a stage singing professionally and they weren't being accompanied by banjos or fiddles or guitars. Mm -hmm. uh, they just sang the songs uh, a cappella, as, the, as we say. Um, and, and the emphasis was on the story and the emphasis was on the delivery of that story. And if, if you could deliver the story, uh, people enjoyed hearing you sing and they wanted more. Yeah. So, uh, uh, one person was asking for a little clarification. Are they saying sore old mule or sorrel mule? Sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L. Ah. So I did look that up at one time and knew what it meant, but it's it's uh, that was a long time ago. So uh, yeah. if anybody, anybody wants to uh, chime in and let us know what a sorrel mule is, uh, it is a term for a mule. I think it just refers to the color of the mule, like a brownish color. Um, <laughs> but I could be wrong. And yeah. again, you know, songs like this, um, they did not necessarily have a, uh, a static set of lyrics. And, and if you sang a different word here or there, then you were singing it wrong. It wasn't like that. You know, these, for the most part, these were songs that traveled from person to person. And as they did that, just like the telephone game uh, that you've probably all played when you tell somebody something and they whisper it to somebody else. And by the time it gets to the, to the uh, back of the room, it's it's somewhat different from how it started. So exact same with these with these old songs, and people would mishear something, so they might sing sore sorrel sore old might have become sorrel or vice versa. And um, it's one of the things that makes this so fascinating is um, with more common songs, you can have um, three different singers in the same town in the 19th century who would have sung. Um, some of the more common folk songs to uh to different melodies and uh and with some differing lyrics as well so kind of uh fascinates me that that uh that oral process we did get some clarification in the comments okay and from elena uh sorrel is a color so, okay kind of a brownish color as i recall but i could be wrong there yeah i, I can't all right well uh, I guess we should get to the elephant in the room then, if there's no more questions, which is the the, uh, the song. A lot of people, when you when you think of low bridges on the Erie Canal, a lot of us had learned this uh, this song in grade school and were taught that it was a folk song from the Erie Canal. It's a song that used to that have Sorry? different ways, of, and it's we were just speaking of songs that have different ways of singing it, right? Which... Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so it's been it's been fascinating to try to trace the origins of the song, and they're still somewhat mysterious. There's been some new scholarship from a guy in Buffalo named Tyler Bagwell just over the last year that's um, that's uh, cast some doubt on on uh, sort of what my understanding of of the song was. Basically, our teachers taught us here's a folk song they used to sing on the Erie Canal. Um, in reality, uh, as far as I'd been able to uh, to ferret out, uh, the song was composed by a man named Thomas S. Allen, who was a professional songwriter from Massachusetts. And Thomas Allen was a, a vaudeville composer. Um, he was a Tin Pan Alley composer. He wrote popular marches uh, of the day. Um, this was his only canal song. Um, but he published it in 1912 and copyrighted it in 1912 and 1913 uh, as a song called, and I've got a picture of the sheep music here, which I hope to be able to pull up. Low Bridge, Everybody Down, or as you can see underneath, 15 Years on the Erie Canal. So I don't know about you, but when I learned this song in grade school, they taught it to us as 15 Miles on the Erie Canal. Um, the original published version of the song lists it, uh, the refrain as 15 years on the Erie Canal. And uh, as it turns out in that, in that copyrighted version, there are no less than five verses and five completely different choruses to the song, but always 
uh, referencing 15 years. So I guess that's what got me started on wanting to get to the bottom of uh, of how what what the origins of the song are. Was it 15 miles or 15 years? Um, 15 years, and Dan Ward and I have talked a lot about this, makes a lot more sense. Um, when you sing the song with the refrain, 15 years on the Erie Canal, it's a man looking back uh, the days of, of horse and mule uh, power on the canal are sort of in the rearview mirror. So it's a man looking back on wistfully on his days on the 19th century canal with his horses, with the horses. There are actually far more horses did the work than mules, but the mules get all the credit, um, I think largely due to this song. Um, so when you sing the song 15, with the refrain 15 years on the Erie Canal and think of it as a man looking back on the old days of the canal, it makes a lot of sense, especially since it didn't come out uh, in published form till the early 1900s. So the question is, was it, was it, was the song active or in use on the canal long before Thomas Allen uh, copyrighted it? Um, that was sort of a common practice back then. Um, these guys who were uh, connected to the publishing houses, they would take a song that was already in the oral tradition or, you know, a sort of folk song and put just enough of a twist on it, just enough of a difference on it to call it their own version, then they would copyright their own version. So the first version of the 15 uh, years on the Erie Canal song uh, ever in print is this Thomas S. Allen version. But the big question is, was, it, was the song in use on the canal before that uh, by canalers? So I had come to the conclusion that, uh, that it had not been. Um, I couldn't find any evidence of those lyrics um, uh, in newspaper reports, in all my 25 years of, of looking through New York State um, archives uh, for folk music material, uh, never once had I heard um, or seen a reference to any of those lyrics from the song uh, existing before Thomas S. Allen printed it. Uh, Tyler Bagwell, I, I had discovered that there was a lawsuit in the 1920s where... Um, in 1926, so Thomas S. Allen publishes the song in 1913 as uh, 15 years on the Erie Canal. In 1926, so 13 years after that, it appears in a folk song collection by uh, a man named Sigmund Spaeth, and he has a different title for the song, and he's the first one to print 15 miles rather than 15 years on the Erie Canal. So... Um, the publishing company that published Thomas S. Allen's version in 1913 um, noticed that their copyrighted song had been printed in Spaeth's book um, at, without permission. And so there was a lawsuit. And so the lawsuit was to determine whether the song was a, was a pre-existing song that, that Haviland, the publisher for Thomas S. Allen, had, had no, um, no right to copyright or uh, if this was a copyright infringement. And so that's as far as I had gotten my research. So enter Tyler Bagwell, who, uh, who was able to find the original court documents. So what he discovered and sent to me was that um, the court ruled in favor of the song being, having been in circulation before Thomas S. Allen uh, copyrighted it. And, but it was based on really, in my mind, flimsy evidence. They had two witnesses who came in and said, I heard the song in the year 1900. So that wouldn't have been possible if Thomas S. Allen published the song in 1912. I heard the song in 1900 and I knew it was the year, I know it was, this was in 1930 of the lawsuit. I know it was the year 1900 because I can remember where we were living the year that I heard my father sing it, right? So here's one guy anecdotally saying he heard the song in, in the year 1900. And a second uh, person says, I learned the song around the year 1906 at the Canoe Club in Buffalo. <laughs> um, so again, about six years before it gets copyrighted. But so first of all, these are both very anecdotal accounts, but the judge uh, ruled in favor of those accounts uh, to determine, um, in at least legally, that the song had been in circulation before. We still don't have ev any evidence that it was in circulation in the 19th century, um, but that's not to say it's not out there. So, where did the song start? It's still a little bit of a mystery. Um, uh, but I'd, uh, love to sing, I'd love to sing a Thomas S. Allen's version, unless you have some questions coming in. Uh, we just, Dan Ward uh, gave us that 
Um, uh, Sorrel Mule is a red colored mule. Red, okay. Someone asked if this will be available on YouTube. We usually make all of our quarantine coffee hours. Yeah. Available later on YouTube. Fine with me. Yep. yep. Okay. So. Oh, we wanted to mention uh, there's a tip jar there too. And um, Derek had asked me about being a full time musician. And of course, I've been. Uh, I've been way late. I've been a full-time musician since 1992, and ever since, uh, since about the middle of March, March 10th, from that point on, all of my concerts have been canceled, and who knows what's going to happen even this summer. So uh, there is a tip jar there. If anybody uh, is inclined to contribute to that, that's very welcome. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to sing for you uh, Thomas S. Allen's uh, copyrighted version of the Mule Named Sal song. This is about as early a version as we can we can uncover, and it, it's it's got uh, it's got a lot more words, as we said, and uh, and some some colorful refrains as well. So this is uh, 15 years on the Erie Canal. I've got an old mule and her name is Sal Fifteen years on the Erie Canal She's a good old worker and a good old pal Fifteen years on the Erie Canal Well, we hauled some barges in our day Filled with lumber, coal, and hay Every inch of the way I know From Albany to Buffalo Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, I must be coming near a town. You can always tell your neighbor, always tell your pal if he's ever navigated on the Erie Canal. Well, we better look around for a job, old gal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. I'd like to see a mule as good as Sal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. Get up there, mule, we've passed that lock. We'll make Rome before six o'clock. One more trip, and then we'll go right straight back to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, I got the finest mule in town. Once a man named Mike McGinty tried to put it over Sal. Now he's way down at the bottom of the Erie Canal. Well, where would I be if I lost my pal? Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. You bet your life I wouldn't part with Sal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. Well, a friend of mine once made her sore. Now he's got a broken jaw. Cause she kicked him with her iron toe. Kicked him back to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, we must be getting near a town. If you're looking around for trouble, Stay away from Sal, she's the only fighting donkey on the Erie Canal. Well, I don't have to call when I want my pal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. She trots from her stall like a good old gal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. I eat my meals with Sal each day. I eat beef. She eats hay, she ain't so slow if you wanna know. Sal put the buff in Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, I got the finest mule in town. She eats a bale of hay for dinner. On top of that, my Sal tries to drink up all the water in the Erie Canal. You'll soon hear him singing all about my gal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. It's a darn fool ditty about a darn fool Sal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. Yes, every band's gonna play it soon. Darn fool words and darn fool tune. You'll hear it sung every place you go. From Mexico to Buffalo. Low bridge, every 
everybody down Low bridge, we must be getting near the town She is a perfect, perfect lady She blushes like a gal When she hears you sing about her in the Erie Canal There you have it, Thomas Allen's copyrighted version of the Mule Named Sal song. Nice. He'll he'll be getting his royalties soon. I hope. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that was a fun one. Um, yeah, we had some. Dennis Reed says R.I.P. to Mike McGinty. There. That's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Our, yeah. There's a, there's a fairly high body count in some of these Erie Canal songs. Yeah. I, they sure enjoyed that in the, the 19th century there. Right. Well, you know, there's this whole thread of humor that that permeates a lot of these songs about the canal being such a dangerous place to be. You know, even Mark Twain uh, picked up on this sort of the, the most well-known canal song in the 19th century uh, from the Erie Canal was uh, this thing called the Raging Canal that came out in the middle of the 19th century. And, and it, it talked about, you know, uh, terrible storms and 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 uh being out there on this massive body of water where you know your boat could capsize and you'd never be seen again um and of course you know sort of poking fun at at really the canalers the life of the canaler as as a, a sort of a minor league mariner uh if you will um and mark twain even picked up on that in the 1870s he wrote a, a wonderful poem if you've not seen it i, I encourage everybody to look for it called The Aged Pilot Man. Um, came out around 1870 or so, but, but pages and pages of verses about uh, impending peril on the canal and trees bending over sideways from the storm. And just when it appears that all is gonna be lost for good uh, on this one canal boat, a farmer walks to the edge of, of his land, uh, to the canal, lays down a plank of wood to the boat and everyone walks safely to shore. <laughs> so uh, the aged pilot man, but there's a as, as you dig more into the the musical end of this, um, there are two different stories about the origins of like this thread of humor about the canal being dangerous. If you talk to the canalers, they made up these lyrics about terrible storms and heavy weather just at, to sort of poke fun of themselves because they were constantly finding themselves in some of the same establishments with the Great Lakes sailors who actually had danger, really dangerous jobs on water. Um, but if you, if you listen to the sailors and, and read the folklore of the Great Lakes sailors, they are the ones that made up all these can, canal danger songs to poke fun at, at the canalers. In fact, uh, Mike Vogel here in Buffalo tells a great story about um, a report from one 19th century evening uh, on the Buffalo waterfront where the sailors have just come in off the Great Lakes and they have a little money in their pockets and the canaler, canalers have ended their route in Buffalo and they have a little money in their pockets so they're all in a, a common tavern one night and the canalers are huddled in one corner and the lake sailors are huddled in another corner and uh, the lake sailors in order to kind of uh, pull one over on the canalers on the count of three, the lake sailors all yell low bridge at the top of their lungs. And what, are, what does the canal table do? They all ducked because it was so much a part of, of your daily life that you didn't question it when somebody yelled low bridge, your, your muscle memory said duck, you know. Uh, so they had a big laugh on that one. Or at least that's the story as it's come down to us. So uh, fascinating to try to, try to tease out, uh, you know, where this stuff comes from. Yeah. That's a good story. I like that one. I hope it's true. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, don't have a lot of other uh, comments at the moment, but all right. Um, um, you've got any others? Yeah, us? maybe I'll finish up with one. Uh, there was a, a rivalry here in Buffalo um, in terms of where who was going to get the terminus of the Erie Canal where was the canal going to end because everybody realized that wherever that canal ended that was going to become a boom town so of course the city of Buffalo wanted the canal to end in Buffalo proper um, the problem with choosing Buffalo as the terminus the western terminus was that uh, there was a sandbar blocking access to um, to the harbor to the shore 
So uh, Buffalo did not really have a naturally suited harbor. Black Rock, on the other hand, which is a little village just about three miles up the Niagara River from Buffalo, made all the sense in the world. It had a naturally suited harbor. It was protected off the Great Lakes by a few miles, so it was protected from the weather that would come off the Great Lakes. And so Black Rock made all the sense in the world, um, and there were people lobbying for Black Rock to become the terminus of the canal. Um, but Buffalo did a couple of smart things. They, uh, they brought DeWitt Clinton, uh, the governor of New York, and uh, the guy commonly referred to as the father of the Erie Canal. Um, they brought DeWitt Clinton to Buffalo in 1816 to show him around and show him. Uh, so even before the canal uh, construction had begun, to show him uh, the, the virtues of Buffalo, I, I suppose. Uh, of course, Buffalo, we have to remember back then, was a small village of maybe 1,500 people in, in 1816. Uh, so they brought, they sort of established a relationship with um, DeWitt Clinton. And then uh, literally as the canal, of course, I think a lot of people realize canal construction didn't start in Buffalo, nor did it start at Albany. It started uh, closer to the middle of the state in Rome, New York, and they worked in both directions. So as the canal construction was uh, heading west and coming closer to Buffalo, there was an awful lot of political wrangling and, and uh, letters to the editor and the local newspapers, where should the canal end? And Buffalonians kind of literally at the last minute went out and dug themselves a harbor. They cleared that sandbar and they, they stole the terminus of the canal from Black Rock. So Buffalo became the big city, uh, the big boom town, and Black Rock remains to this day a small little village within the city limits of Buffalo. But uh, Black Rock was uh, kind of uh, well known on the canal for a food product uh, for years afterwards that came out of, uh, reportedly out of a grocery store run by a man named Leonard in the 1840s, this stuff they called Black Rock pork. It was, it was, sort, of the, uh, it was sort of the perfect food for a canal boat because, of course, there was no refrigeration. And um, it was essentially a salted, cured, dried pork that would keep for years. So they'd pack this stuff into barrels and roll it on board the canal boats. And sometimes if you were crew on one of the boats, there wasn't much more for you to eat. So uh, this is a little ditty that uh, one of the canalers made up about black rock pork. <laughs> I shipped on board of a lumber boat by the name of the Charles O'Rourke. Yeah, the very first thing that we rolled on board was a barrel of black rock pork. pork. <laughs> we fried a chunk for luncheon and a chunk for dinner, too. But it was not so goody good, and it was hard to <whistles> chew. <whistles> From Buffalo to old New York, they fed it to poor old me. Then we boiled up the barrel and the rest of the pork, and we had it all for... Free. Tea. Oh. I shipped on board another lumber boat by the name of the Timmy O'Rourke. Yeah, the very next thing that they rolled on board was some more of that black rock pork. <laughs> All right. Yeah. There we go. I I almost got. I think I got one of the things. You got, you, I think you did well, Derek. I'm going to give you a, a two out of three. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But I'm cool. aiming for. Uh, oh, also, yeah. I was uh, going to say we actually one of our other quarantine coffee hours was on the whole Buffalo Black Rock debate. So. Ah, great. So who did that one? Find out more. About uh, well, I'm sorry. I'd yeah. love to hear that. Who, who was who was uh, giving that presentation? It was me. So. Ooh. Oh, cool. So, um, 
So yeah, I encourage everyone to check out the museum's uh, YouTube page. You can find all these coffee hours uh, on there. Yeah, uh, they've, been, they've really, as I was saying to you before we started recording, they've really been excellent, Derek. Uh, really enjoyed John Montague uh, talking about the recreation of the Seneca Chief, the, the very first boat uh, to travel the length of the canal um, with Governor DeWitt Clinton and a whole flotilla behind him. Um, and so the, uh, that's a multi-year project that's underway right now in the city of Buffalo and uh, exciting stuff. And it's interesting to hear how he's going about it. So yeah. that was a great one. And I encourage people to check out. Yeah. Well, I personally wish we could, uh, we could keep going here. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a lot more Erie Canal songs out there. Oh, right there are for sure. Yeah. 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 And um, you can probably, people out there watching can find more i'm sure at your website yeah right? uh dave ruck.com dave r-u-c-h.com is the website and um also on youtube there's uh there's several videos up right yep and uh we also we have some cds in our gift shop i know and dvds you're on um yep you're on the pbs documentary correct yeah yeah they uh they asked me to be a part of that and also uh CBS Sunday Morning, the Sunday morning show, um, did a thing on the canal back in 2017 when everybody was paying a lot of attention to the canal as the 200th anniversary of the beginning of construction. Um, and so I, I went on CBS Sunday Morning in front of six million people and sang the uh, the Erie Canal song, the, the 15 years on the canal song. So that was a that was a that was fun. Nice. Yeah. Um, OK, well. Many of those things I know I I was told to, to plug this. Many of those can be found in our gift shop, which is we do have online ordering. Uh, um, yeah, great resource. Thanks a lot, Dave. This was a fascinating thanks, uh, program. Uh, once uh yeah, once live music starts happening again, I look forward to going to see one of your, your shows. Oh. Oh, great. And uh, I look forward to coming back to the museum. I've gotten to perform there several times over the years. It's always been great and uh, really fun and supportive audience there. So uh, best of luck to you guys. I hope you get back in there sooner rather than later. And um, best of luck to everybody out there. Yes. Yeah. Well, well thanks, Dave. And uh, we will 